This is David McCall, host of the QTS Experience podcast. Some say you and I were sold the benefits of a fully realized 5G infrastructure when we're still in the 4G plus phase. Yet the conversation about 6G has already started. Well, telecom futurist and expert Dean Bubbly helps us to understand the actual status of the Gs, and he also leads us through a great conversation of artificial intelligence, telecom, and the future of Wi-Fi. Join us for the conversation on the next QTS Experience. The most valuable commodity on earth today is data. Make it, use it, move it, and protect it. My name's David McCall. Join me today for the QTS Experience. First of all, thank you for being generous with your time and coming on and letting me pick your brain again. It seems in the la in the many conversations that we've had, both on air and off air, um, one of the things that I love about you is debunking some of the myth around, I'm just going to say telecom technologies, it, without picking on any particular one, right? Hold on. Which is to say, sometimes people, if they're lazy, could say, well, he must not be for, you know, he's not for the future or modernity or what? Not, not true. You're 100% for, you're not saying these won't evolve. It's just usually it's more the engineering obstacles or the regulatory obstacles that have to be overcome and the applications and kind of demystifying and getting rid of the hype. So why is it then people are already talking about 6G? When I... I, I don't, what the heck, first of all, what is 6G and why the heck are we even talking about 6G? Well, I suppose the first thing is we don't know quite what 6G is. That's why we're talking to decide what it should be, okay. what are the design goals and priorities, what areas of R&D need funding, and you know, are there any long lead time processes, for example, around radio spectrum and regulation that we start need to think about eight to ten years in advance okay yeah, and in particular if you're going to clear let's let's say there's a bit of spectrum which is currently used by satellites or the military or whatever yeah you know, and you want to repurpose it for whatever 6g turns out to be yeah that's a decade-long process and probably lots of lawyers involved so you have to start that early the same thing if, if it's fundamental research you know never, never mind the development of the r bit of r d there's funding for university courses and PhDs in, you know, next generation antennas or MIMO algorithms or whatever beam forming or the latest hot thing is reconfigurable surfaces. Yeah, and it's literally people doing the the peer, their, their research and postdocs in those at the moment and doing publishing and getting their results out, and that might then feed into six G. So, to some extent the discussions are of those early stage ones but there's also people who start talking about use cases and some of that is where i, I agree with you it's it's is whether it's hype there's lots of people talking about immersive this and haptic the other um uh, you know can we do underwater communications and basically I, i've got like in my mind the the way i think 6g has got a, a a binary choice either we chase after these extreme use cases and performance and gigabit terabit this and sub millisecond the other and metaverse for dolphins as a, as a use case or we go for maximum usefulness of actually making it work properly in as many places as possible ideally with the lowest energy consumption and, and a reasonable cost and i'm trying to help whether it's vendors or policy makers steer to the latter option um, apologies to the dolphins. Oh, I was about to say, I don't know if you knew this, but you've just inspired me to restart my 15-year-old dormant World of Warcraft account and start, start a guild called Metaverse for Dolphins. Like, that has got to be... I'm going to beat a night elf ranger in the Metaverse for Dolphins guild and just go wreck face. They'll never see it coming. That's so funny. I You need to, you need to uh, copyright that. Uh, hey, so... Okay, so pause. So I get it now. 6G, f for, those of us, for those of you that are close to it, this is really th the planning stage. We, um, you know, we're, we're looking down. It's not that we've skipped five or five's already deployed because I, I hardly ever see it unless I'm at an, a race or a coliseum or something like that. 
but I want to pa- let's pause for just a second and let's back up a little bit. You've spent some time helping to explain to your audience, you've got this amazing newsletter that you post regularly through LinkedIn primarily, um, but I'm sure other sources, and we'll make sure we link to those. And you start off a conversation about, um, it's sort of philosophical and a little bit of engineering, but philosophical engineering, but really I want us to think about these things. And it is around this idea of what telecom is, how it evolved in, 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 not from an engineering perspective, but just sort of how those words came together and what were the big ideas, the historical context. I think it's a fascinating discussion. And then where it leads is the logical conclusion then, so is this bucket of stuff over here, telecom, because it doesn't fit that paradigm. Is it something else? And if it is, should those people be involved in this? So can you can you just help uh, my audience understand that conversation about telecom and what you coin paracom yeah no that's the to, to me this is a really important distinction i see between communications and networks that fulfill the original purpose of telecommunications and tele is from the greek meaning distance mm-hmm. and the original telegraph and then telephone were typically calls or messages sent over hundreds or thousands of miles Um, uh, and that has a set of characteristics Um, never mind whether it's data or voice the point is it's long distance normally it starts on one network and finishes on another network with perhaps intervening networks in the middle at some point the signal crosses what I'll call the public domain. You have to dig up a street, put a fiber on a pole, you know, use a satellite. There's a sort of a public environment somewhere involved in that. Um, you're, because it's a distant communication, your control points, your switches or whatever, yeah, that's also likely to be somewhere distant, perhaps in a data center, for example. Um, there's usually a lot of government involvement, partly because of the history of using it for you know, defence or public in- national infrastructure, but because a lot of that public domain requires licensing or rights of way. Yeah, so there's a, there's a lot of government involvement one way or another. And, and that, to my mind, is very different to local or close proximate communications. Um, which in the history of mankind has been people talking to each other face to face. But now we've got local networks and LAN, most obviously we've had in the office for whatever that is, 20, 30 Mm -hmm. years now. Um, But you've you've got now private 5G for factories or ports. You've got, frankly, a Bluetooth headset is is connecting your phone to your your ear pods or whatever. Um, You've got, if you really want to boil it down, a USB cable. And so you've got short range communications, which is not hundreds of hundreds or thousands of miles. It's going over. I'm going to switch between imperial and metric measurements here, a meter or a hundred meter radius on your campus or 10 centimeters between devices, or maybe even you know, one centimeter between two things on a, on a motherboard of a, of a process mm-hmm. uh, sorry, of, a, of a computer. Um, And really, those are two very different things. The first thing is that that proximate communication is usually both things are on the same network. There isn't an interconnect. Secondly, it doesn't cross the public domain. It's inside your house or inside your office or factory or inside your car. Um, It's much less relevant and more difficult for governments to get involved in that because it's on private property. And if I want to connect my PC to my printer, I don't expect to have a license for it or, or, or there to be regulation associated with it. And so you know, increasingly we see communications network operators and public operators talking about functions which really are, they're not telecommunications, and I use this term pericommunications. <laughs> yeah, I could have called it sort of proxy communications, but I'd be mixing my Greek and Latin if I did that. So I was trying to find the best the best Greek term. And and, and yeah, I, I, that doesn't mean that the operators can't play in that, the traditional operators, but they can't assume it. They have no entitlement or, or sort of entitlement to local connectivity as well as distant connectivity. Um, and also from a regulatory point of view, 
all of the things that we we have in place for telecommunications policy and regulation, you know, the FCC or Ofcom or the ITU, the UN agency, International Telecoms Union, you know, those are all concerned with the distant part of this. Maybe we need a, a completely different regulatory apparatus for for close up. And to some extent, we get that with things like short range wireless. Um, spectrum licensing for it could be Wi-Fi, it could be Bluetooth, it could be medical devices communicating with each other. So there's, there is all already something of a divide there. But I think we also have to, to accept that the local communication is not necessarily a service. It, it's owned or an amenity. Again, if I connect my PC to a printer, I'm not paying a subscription for that. Yeah, unless the printer vendor somehow manages to add it onto the bill for the toner cartridges. But it's it's not a connectivity service. It's a piece of wire or a Bluetooth or a Wi-Fi connection, and I think that 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 is really a wholly separate market, and it's got a lot of value. And the interesting thing is when you look at um, a lot of the I don't, I don't really believe the stats, but let's take them at face value. It was oh, there's going to be billions or trillions of GDP and uplift from five G or fiber, whatever it is. A lot of that is local. It's machine A talking to machine B inside a factory. Mm -hmm. Now, possibly that's going via cloud C, which is long distance, but yeah, often that's going to be edge compute and it's going to be in the in the car park, there's a there's a rack of servers in a container. Right. And maybe it does the, the time series analytics on the hyperscale cloud. They said that's a different story. That's that's mm -hmm. that's long distance. So I I, I I think this this distinction between short range and long range communications as it's got technical, it's got business, and it's got regulatory um, uh, angles. So. This could sound very unusual, but when I, I remember in the early days, at least in small, s smaller metropolitan areas, the original people to service computers and um, uh printers and print cues were copier companies because they were already doing business machines. They were already bringing fax machines, printers, et cetera. And in the beginning, they felt like, well, this is just an, this is just an evolution of that sort of in the office business machine, maybe not in a metropolitan area like London or in New York City, but in a Birmingham, in a Manchester, you know, an, an intermediate sized city um, where they didn't have a bunch of already trained computer technicians in the early 80s, mid 80s, <clears throat> uh, even into the early 90s, copier companies would fill that role. They would send their techs off to learn how to fix that IBM XT or fill in the blank, that, that personal computer. And then they extended it um, to the OS a little bit, so kind of into the, you know, probably 97 era, uh, 1997. And it began to break down when they started to move, networks began, you know, you're moving from Microsoft Post Office into Exchange and Banyan Vines and mainframe people and whatever. But anyway, it was... Uh, it, it just became complicated, and they they would what they would do is they would either um, sell that division to somebody who wanted to start a com quote unquote computer company, or they would split the organization into multiple organizations. At least I remember a lot of that. I worked at the University of Texas, and we saw a lot of that. And over time, it's evolved into much different things. In fact, I don't even know if there are very many copier companies around anymore. But it was um, it, it it was this sort of well, we're the folks on the scene. We already know how to work on these electronic machines, so we 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 should be the ones to start this. And then it evolved into something different. I had never considered that before your conversation around telecom. That that of course, in the beginning, if they're the ones that are establishing, um, you know, these distant things, and then the modems first start coming into our offices and all of these other things, why wouldn't they be the ones? But I love your question, which is, well, maybe they could continue to be that, but should they? Um, or shouldn't they? It's a it's a fair idea to contend with. And what does that future look like? By, but but by default, we shouldn't just default that this is the logical group to manage these local things. I, I, yeah, no, I completely agree. And it's, it's sort of a really interesting point about the the uh, sort of facilities bureau type model you're mentioning. <laughs> um, but, but yeah, it's it's yeah. It, there's this is often an assumption I find in telecoms that 
anything involving a network is rightfully belongs to what we call a telco. Right. And my view is there are opportunities, but you've got to work for them and you've got to compete with everyone else. And there's no like you know sense of entitlement that's justified. Um yeah, and you, yeah, to some extent, this has happened. I mean, mobile communications originally was about mobility, people moving around or vehicles moving around. Right. And yet we all then refer to a mobile phone, even when you're sitting at a desk or on your sofa. And to some extent, th- there's almost like been the expectation that nomadic usage is rightfully part of the the same um, business model. And that's that's more just a... Uh, a sort of uh, consequence of of history, where it the, the the mobile phone has a very convenient uh, call register, um, and so and phone book compared to most desk phones or, or fixed landline phones at home. So people started using their mobile phones at home or in the office as soon as the prices were low enough. Um, so to some extent, they they, they sort of got um, gifted an additional incremental adjacent market. But that wasn't, as far as I know, by any conscious decision. It just happened to work like that because the user experience of the phone was better. And that's not necessarily true for for sort of, say, enterprise networking in an industrial site or a port or an airport. Yeah, they've got very specific applications, requirements on networks. Yeah, something like a mine, there's all sorts of engineering challenges of getting networks in a mine working. And there are some operators that set up specialized business units to do it. So Telstra in Australia, the Latin American branch of, branches of Telefonica do great business putting private networks in mines. But there's another 800 carriers that don't because they haven't they head around mining. It's, uh, <clears throat> I thought it was a fascinating conversation and a fascinating distinction. Um, and and who knew a regular blue collar guy from UK was that good with Greek? Like I had no idea. That was pretty amazing. So your lexicon in action. Um, when you were a kid, did you ever imagine as you're getting ready to go to school or just go out in the workforce, I'm going to be sitting around talking about this kind of stuff uh, 25 or 30 years from now, or or did you just always dream of being a London taxi driver or or one of those canal boat operators? No, I didn't really. I, I probably saw myself perhaps more as a potentially as a scientist, or um, I, I, you know, I didn't really have a sort of specific objective um, to to become well what I am now. Um, I, that said, I did for a few years, more than a few years. I did learn Latin at school, well, but not but not Greek. <laughs> I love it. Hey, let's um, if we can come back to. 5G and 6G. So let's set 6G aside for a second. 5G, are, are we making real progress there or is it still um, limping along? What I, what I, the way I characterize 5G is it comes in phases. And phase one of 5G essentially is 4G plus. Faster speeds, but it doesn't really do much else. Yeah, it's, it's essentially more of the same of what we had. Um, the second phase is where the network evolves to sort of what they call cloud native. It has a new core and control infrastructure for the network. It, it becomes more service oriented. It's software software based, mostly more virtualized, and that's sort of like the stage two. And then stage three is where you get a lot of the fancier features come in progressively, building on top of that cloud native base. At the moment, we are just at the early stages of phase two. Okay. So a lot of the carriers have done this sort of early version of, of 5G, which to be honest, it offers higher peak speeds and not much more, mm. um, which is fine. But yeah, frankly, there's a limit to number of megabits a second you can use unless you're doing a speed test, if you're a consumer in particular. Right. Um, uh, and so all the new stuff isn't there yet. And so everyone's now suddenly become disappointed because the industry sold sold the benefits of phase three on the timeline of phase one right um, without bothering to mention to anyone including investors and politicians in some cases um that there was like a five-year gap or or some you know, it could be four years could be six years whatever right. the number is uh between the two and so we're currently in this sort of phase where 
there's a lot of hard work and time and money and, and, and effort trying just trying to get the phase two working properly. I was at this event I was at this morning, and you know the head of um, uh, network for Vodafone UK, one of the largest operators, was saying, yeah, essentially there's still bits of the software that aren't baked properly yet. That you know they've got some hard this, you know, engineering choices to make. They, they need to make sure that that phase two, like two dot one, isn't actually worse in some situations than phase one dot five or whatever it is. Yeah. So and so there's all sorts of horrible things of well, do all the devices work? Can we run the new phase two at the same time as as all our users now millions of users on on the older now phase one devices? Mm -hmm. And so they've got lots of complications to 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 handle with that. Plus, also at the same time, certainly in the UK, there's a bunch of requirements for the, for the network operators to rip out a lot of their uh, Chinese gear and replace it with something else. Yeah, which they have here as well. So, so they're having to do that in tandem. <laughs> um, so, yeah, they've got a lot, a lot to do. But the net result is everyone's going, "Is that it?" A bit about five G. Um, and the yeah, there's signs in some places a bit of revenue uplift from fixed wireless access. Yeah, in markets like South Korea, where it's frankly it's easier to do good um, citywide coverage and in-building coverage, and there's fibre everywhere, there is some evidence of a small amount of revenue uplift. Difficult to tell correlation versus causation, particularly when you know prices are going up because of inflation. Is is trying to trying to work out are you making more running money because of five G or because of inflation is is a difficult one to tease out, to be honest. Yeah. Um, so, so the, the, there is this sort of bit of a couple of year gap where everyone's sort of going, you know, did you oversell this? And the answer is, in some cases, yes, it was massively oversold. Right. And particularly when there was like fairly simplistic messaging to policymakers, regulators, largely because the industry wanted to get hold of spectrum, favorable terms, investment funding. You know, some of the hype you can justify a bit in terms of you know, bringing in money. But ultimately, if you've got politicians going around saying, oh, you know, in a year's time, there's going to be ubiquitous 5Gs, can do all these magical things, you're going to have millisecond latency everywhere. You're not. Right. Uh, and I think there's this bit of a hangover now where they've got to you know, fill in the, the hard work to meet the promises they made and even then, it's going to be quite late. It, it's, it's almost like you see the, I don't know, the um, not to pick on marketing too much, but I'm going to pick on them a little bit. You'll see an ad that says, look, you know, and in the, with our 5G network, the central hospital here in London will be connected to Manchester and Birmingham. And it's we're going to cure cancer rates by 32% because of the imaging. And, you know, it's, people are expecting that. And do, do you have any friends or family that hate to sit around you when ads like that come on and you just can't stop yourself? Like, please. L yeah. Luckily, luckily, <laughs> none, none of my friends yourself? Not, not, would, would ever, would ever even expect to get to hit. I, I mean, I, yeah, I'll mention a few things, but I mean, to be honest, on the hospital example, uh -huh. there's a classic, classic case that the hospitals, uh, I unfortunately had a couple of family members in hospitals recently and, you know, a lot of the things like the emergency rooms and, and operating theatres are usually underground, three walls from the outside of the building, right. and may well have zero cellular coverage at all. Right. Yeah. And, and I mean, particularly if you're going to do some of the magical things they talk about, you've got all sorts of sensitive <laughs> electronics and, quite frankly, metal screening everywhere as well. Right. So, yeah, that's a great example of, of where... Yeah, yes, you can have your robotic surgery, but only if it's outdoors um, in a city centre, uh, yeah, or something like that. <laughs> only if it's outdoors on the holodeck, up, you know, or up on top of the roof. I and, look. And I, you, you could make an argument for some corner cases, like you know, a paramedic at a roadside accident, um, sure. where they want to get you know, bring a consultant in to decide if someone can be put on a stretcher or if they need a neck brace or whatever it happens to be, right? <laughs> Um, there, yes, absolutely. You can do high res video. Maybe you, you, you've got connectivity for various medical um, diagnostics equipment in the ambulance. Fine, uh, and absolutely, uh, the, those type of scenarios, yes. But for the day to day use cases, it was massively oversold. Yeah, I sometimes feel like, and this is, I try not to be cynical because I love. There is no doubt in my mind, whatever the generation, the potential of these things. Not only is it 
exist, it's, it's going to be transformative. I, I don't know when it's going to get here. It's for sure going to probably by fits and starts get here. But sometimes I feel like these marketing ads are, you know, an explorer who's trying to fund his uh, wooden vessel standing in front of a king or queen of a ancient colonial power saying, and there's untold riches that way. And if you just fund this mission, off we go and you were going to bring back, you know, uh, whatever, whatever it is that we're out there trying to get. I just crack up. I'm like, I, that's, and but they, but the kings and queens keep falling for it. I mean, they, we want to believe it. It, it sells ads. The consumers want to buy into it. And uh, I don't know. It is. It's a difficult one. I mean, because yeah, there is a, a sort of a, a an appetite to to sort of believe in a lot of this, and, and it is necessary a bit to get investment. But, the, but, but it gets to a certain point where. Yeah, the, the, there's sort of second order effects, either in terms of creating disappointment, but also from a regulatory point of view, you suddenly um, have governments saying, well, you know, according to what you've been saying, 5G is going to run the entire country, therefore we need to regulate it within an entity's life because it becomes critical infrastructure. Right. And everyone's going, oh, no, 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 I didn't mean that. No, no, you know, it's going to be important, but, you know. <sighs> Let's not get ahead of ourselves. <clears throat> yeah, I... That balance between enough um, enough parts of it attractive to solicit investment, while at the same time encouraging patience because of the promised productivity or or experience, while avoiding um, you know the number one way to kill that is to come in and pr have premature legislation and regulation, which while necessary probably in its fully mature form as it's being developed has never enhanced anything ever you know it just uh um i don't know it's a it's a trifecta of difficulty it is yeah so so there's definitely this this sort of balancing act and i think they they got it a bit wrong um and, and i think there's there's now a lot of people who are, who are asking questions who committed to this and yeah who, who are saying yeah particularly like politicians who, who are sort of saying all right right by 2025 this is what's going to happen and everyone's thinking looking at two years and going hope you haven't got an election when you promised all that because the industry is not going to deliver it yeah uh can i ask you i, I want to pivot for a second um if you feel like we there's more to fill in about 5g or 6g let's do it but at some point i feel like as much as we talk about those terms i'm not even sure when i talk to people in the data center business like non telecom people but people that would say they're close to connectivity if that makes any sense like they know wan and lan and um infra connectivity infrastructure within certainly last mile stuff in and around a data center because we talk about fiber access and all this. And so it gives us the illusion that we know what we're talking about when we we really don't. In fact, I'm in a generation now when I said to somebody the other day, you know, you're getting old when you said, you know, the old battery rooms. I talk about telecom and somebody's like, battery room? Why do telecoms have battery rooms? I was like, oh boy, I'm dating myself. But in any event, I never hear anybody talking about the sexiness or the current developments of Wi-Fi. They always talk about Either either 5G or um, possibly 6G, but certainly 5G, the Gs, or they'll talk about how we're getting CubeSats up and um, we're building, uh, um, you know, satellite networks and constellations and the pros and cons of that and all that other stuff. But I almost never hear anybody talking about just good old Wi-Fi, which develops the overwhelming majority of our services, uh, certainly the many times the best experiences is it just because it's not very sexy and two um what is going on as far as you understand in the world of wi-fi in terms of development well well i i, I spend quite a lot of time looking at wi-fi and uh I'll, I'll i'll mention the supposed lack of lack of sexiness to um it was kevin robinson is the new uh, wi-fi alliance head Okay. Uh, I'll see him in a couple of weeks' time. The, the, there's a series of conferences called Wi-Fi Now. Uh, so uh, the, the Rio event I went to recently was one of those, and there's one in uh, Brighton, south of London, in three weeks' time. Um, so, and in fact, this afternoon I was on a webinar organised by a UK policy group about Wi-Fi, 
Um, th there is quite a bit going on. Um, probably the thing that I think most people got confused by, but is actually now, as most as about four years ago, they switched from these rather arcane 80211 AC, you know, version N, whatever, which is still used by the IEEE, the, the, the industry, te the technology standards body. Wi-Fi mm -hmm. lines switched to just num numbering the generations of Wi-Fi, similar to, to 4G, 5G. It's now Wi-Fi 5, 6, I'll come on in a second to what 6E is, right. and then 7 is <clears throat> is is the, the new thing which is just being finalised at the moment, uh, and there's very, very early talks about what 8 might be. Okay. Um, and so, so you've got this sort of sudden speed up. There's about a 12 year gap with what we now call Wi-Fi 5 to getting to Wi-Fi 6. And I think that's one of the reasons why people didn't, didn't think about it that much. Um, and essentially the later versions of Wi-Fi, they're much better at um, the, the sort of higher headline throughput, but also more concurrent uh, connected devices. Um, they've actually started to engineer in low latency wi-fi latency has often been low um often better than than many other technologies but they've never really talked about it mm. um and the other thing is that there's a large tranche of new spectrum that is becoming available around the world is you know, in, in the us and uh, brazil and canada and south korea and, and saudi arabia and a number of other countries there's like 1.2 gigahertz of new spectrum in the six gig band which is a massive chunk of new spectrum that allows for not just higher speeds, but you could more controllability, um, different channel sizes, which makes um, uh, gives more options for both. You know, it could be shipping video traffic around or industrial automation. So in, in some parts of the world, there's 1.2 gigahertz. In some parts of the world, like uh, most of Europe, there's about 500 meg, the low part of the band. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of political and regulatory wrangling about what happens to the top part of the band. Does it get made available for Wi-Fi and unlicensed use, or does it get used for 5G and licensed? Mm -hmm. And that's a massive hot potato for the next six months until we've got the World Radio Congress at the end of the year, which apparently ought to clarify things. And then China... I think there are other countries where they're not really pursuing six gigahertz Wi-Fi at all, um, and instead just dedicating it to 5G. Um, so there's this sort of new set of things that are going on, and, and sort of Wi-Fi, the later versions, 6E and 7 in particular, get access to this new spectrum, and that gives essentially higher performance, higher reliability, lower latency, and some other sort of cool other cool features. Um, so that's happening now. So increasingly Wi-Fi is, the, the most obvious thing is if you've got a gigabit, if you get gigabit broadband, which a lot of the world is getting, mm. at the moment, you can have a gigabit farm to your house, but you can't have gigabit to every room. Right. And so being able to take the, the ingress fibre to, to your house, um, use it either with one access point or the other new thing recently is mesh networks and, and sort of whole home Wi-Fi um, is, is quite a big deal. Um, and it also means that if you're a, an ISP trying to sell gigabit broadband, you've suddenly got a way to actually provide gigabit capability to, you know, whether you need it or not. And the idea here is you know, it's future proof for years, if not decades. Um, and and so it also changes the dynamic a bit in industrial settings, <clears throat> where there's a lot of people who have basically been saying, look, my warehouse, the Wi-Fi, it's terrible interference, the robots don't work very well. The newer versions of Wi-Fi are closer to the performance of the some of the private 5G networks in terms of mitigating interference, uh, giving uh, potentially guaranteed latency or, or deterministic latency, having higher throughput, being better where, when your automatic robotic forklift goes from one access point to the next, there's a better chance of not having a break in the connection while it does it. So there's, there's a, essentially all that's evolving faster. The Wi-Fi Alliance is is doing some quite good uh, marketing around this in terms of the economic value. I, I don't think the industry does enough in raising its profile and talking to regulators, policymakers, and media. Mm -hmm. People use Wi-Fi everywhere, but it rarely gets a mention in um, policy documents. The UK has got a bit better about that. Space. The US FCC is as long. You know, you, the FCC did a good job in releasing 6 gigahertz, largely because the previous chairman, Ajit Pai, who was widely criticised for other things, the one thing he was, he was a massive Wi-Fi fan. 
Yeah. I came to one of the conferences and was like, no, I, I remember using this when I was in my 20s. It's fantastic. Right. So he did quite a lot of good work on that. In the UK, finally, I've, I've and various other people persuaded government to start talking about advanced connectivity rather than specifying 5G or fibre or Wi-Fi or satellite. Basically, look, there's various forms of advanced connectivity. It's a whole toolkit. And hopefully that story gets picked up around the world because you know, fundamentally there's different technologies for different purposes or even combinations. Mm -hmm. So if you've got a, a ship, then satellite's more interesting. If you're connecting something in your house, that you're watching Netflix on a TV, that will be connected with Wi-Fi or maybe an Ethernet cable. Mm -hmm. um, if you're on an AR headset, almost all AR headsets today are Wi-Fi based or a USB cable, but we might start seeing ones which are 5G capable, maybe for field workers, for utility grids, fixing fixing cabling or something like that. Um, so there's going to be you know, the right network technology. Other things going on in Wi-Fi, there's some stuff around um, better federation and roaming between different um, places you might use Wi-Fi so you don't have to log on everywhere. It can be automated. Maybe you link your um, frequent flyer card to your hotel um, account. So if I, if, you know, maybe, maybe Marriott logs me onto the Wi-Fi with my British Airways credentials or something like that, right. or maybe the bank with your SIM card. Yeah, you, you, you know, the classic one is roaming with your SIM identity on your phone, or I think Samsung has got a, an identity credentials. You can imagine Google and Apple potentially. So that that sort of rat, um, roaming is getting interesting. And the other thing I was talking about today was a thing called Open Wi-Fi, which is a project to um, disaggregate cloud Wi-Fi to re reduce vendor lock-in for certain classes of user or, or service provider, like a managed service provider for guest Wi-Fi in a building, where you can you can essentially get separate cloud controller and branded access points from multiple providers. So there's a fair amount that's going on, I would say. But yeah, you're right, it doesn't get the publicity. Um, yeah, I think people would just assume, oh, it's another version of Wi-Fi, it's a bit faster. And and the, at least until recently, you've been talking about 5G as if it's a, a fix for everything. Yeah. Well, one of the two, I have a question and a comment. My comment is, I don't, at least in my home or in my immediate circle, when people talk about Wi-Fi, they don't speak of it as if it owes them something. Meaning, like when I think about, you know, 5G, there's like this hope that it's going to, it's going to deliver some experience, some different, uh, uh, mobile, you know, you imagine sort of the example used earlier, the, the paramedic at the side of the road and he's got a hologram and he's, you know, he's, he's doing his scanner and they're, they're, we're transmitting massive amounts of data back to some uh, organization or person that's able to receive it, interpret it in real time and, you know, and re intervene to save people's lives or make a, a decision to redirect in a catastrophic event or, w or whatever it is. There's this thing... <clears throat> Uh, like that. And so there's this great hope and when it doesn't deliver, it's disappointing. And whereas with Wi-Fi, it's just sort of, you know, it's it's like your steady date. It's always there. You know, you're not, you're not, I don't mean to, any disrespect to respect to steady dates, but in my house, we have a sign. I've been married uh, almost 37 years. My wife's half Irish and half Japanese. And we have a sign in our kitchen that says, you want to talk to the man of the house or the woman who runs the place? And I feel like that's you know, you want to talk to 5G who runs the house or the Wi-Fi who runs the place? Like the, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I realize as you've described, there are different purposes or different applications where these things thrive the best for sure. But feels like the most practical day to day for me, at least in the near term, is uh, Wi-Fi. Like I'll get more benefit by the more energy efficient, more powerful, more um, seamless integration in roaming Wi-Fi than I will, uh, you know, some new generation of cellular connectivity. It, it, yeah, I, I, I think it depends what you're doing. I mean, it, it's like if you're, I mean, I'm, I'm connected to Wi-Fi at the moment, um, you yeah, know, to my home broadband. If I go and watch TV later or a movie, I'll be connecting the TV to Wi-Fi and I'm asking um, the Amazon le uh, lady, whose name I'm not going to mention. Yeah, don't mention. 
that's Wi-Fi again, right? Yeah. And and the vacuum cleaner. So there's a bunch of stuff which is is Wi-Fi only. But equally, if I get in the car, I'm using Google Maps. Sure. That cellular. Um, yeah. yeah, I'm walking down the street and I'm trying to work out where the next train is or something like that. So there's there's use cases. And you when you can sort of very roughly say cellular outdoors, Wi-Fi indoors, it's not quite right, but it's yeah. it's a first first order approximation. And obviously Wi-Fi is also dependent on being good fixed broadband infrastructure. Some parts of the world that's true, some it's less true. Sure. So yeah, yeah. So I th- I think I think it's it's reasonable. Um, it, I, one of the things I noticed in, in the UK, and I don't know if it's true uh, elsewhere, is people often refer to their home broadband as the Wi-Fi. They don't yeah. talk about ISP, and it's actually Wi-Fi has become synonymous with broadband. Yeah. Um, uh, to the extent that most of the broadband advertising is, you know, there's one I saw recently: connect up to a hundred devices in your home yeah. as an ISP's advert or we give you the best Wi-Fi signal. Yeah. You know, they weren't talking about whether it's attached to fiber or, or copper or cable or anything else. It's like, you know, we know the customer talks in terms of, you know, what, is the Wi-Fi down? Uh, and, and I think it's also an issue, even the cellular industry. Yeah, so people don't really understand the difference between wireless networks. Um, and so sometimes Wi-Fi becomes almost like this generic term. Yeah, which probably annoys Wi-Fi Alliance, which likes to brand it and only let certified uh, devices use it. Yeah, you you know, it's I didn't realize that my brain was doing a translation between broadband because when I got my first DSL, the end of the 90s or early 2000, um, I didn't think of it in terms of, not only did I not think of it in terms of Wi-Fi, I thought of it as a specific type of broadband. It was DSL broadband. I am curious. we, we got to talk about the future. Well, let's talk about the, a moment that the world's having as we think about the future. Two areas that are, one area that's fascinating to me, and I'm not sure beyond security what its impact on technology will be, and that's quantum computing, if you want to tackle mm-hmm. that. But the second is, The whole world is talking about, the public world is talking about um, generative AI, natural language model AI, and whether that's in the form of ChatGPT or Google's BART or whatever. These, 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 this specific application of artificial intelligence tools in your world that has to come up with some regularity. How how does it how do people imagine that it's going to benefit or negatively impact or however you want to go with that those particular tools and is and is quantum on the horizon for you guys is in the same way that it is we think it's going to impact um, encryption and other parts of the technology stack. Yeah, no, I'll do quantum first because I've been okay. following that for years, uh, and this this it's worth saying as well as quantum computing. There's quantum computing, quantum if you like, communications, and also quantum sensing. Mm. Which, so there's a, a whole sort of family of quantum technologies um, that are worth looking at because they're not all about the sort of how many qubits have you got right. uh, in your quantum computer. But certainly the, the the key key things I see in terms of touch point with telecoms are, you know, does quantum computing mean en- encryption algorithms are made obsolete? And they're relevant for you know, the internals of the network, obviously data which is stored. Uh, there's a whole set of, of uh, yeah, the, the credentials on a SIM card. There's all sorts of um, things which are encrypted and people are looking to see if they are quantum safe and if not, what you can do about it. Right. Um, so that's certainly a concern as it is throughout the, the whole of the, the sort of IT and, and networking industry. The other side to it is around um, quantum key distribution. Um, this is the, the, the flip side of security, which is can you use quantum technology and entanglement to uh, make unbreakable keys uh, for encryption? And is there a role for um, a network service provider, which could be terrestrial, it could be, I've seen, satellite in acting as a, you know, ultra secure key as a service provider? Um, and I've seen some stuff that BT has done and SKT in Korea, and I'm sure others as well. Obviously, it has a lot of implications for government, for finance, public safety, defense, and so on. Um, there's some 
fairly techy stuff around the use of quantum technology for timing synchronization. Um, and whether in particular sort of, you know, uh, uh, you might not know this, but for the, the cellular um, base stations use often GPS timing to make sure they're all synchronized because you, know, you need to have very, very precise timing um, to determine slots of, you know, particularly in radio where you've got uh, the same frequency used for upstream, then downstream, upstream, then downstream. You obviously need to have everything synchronized right. with a shared time down to the nanosecond level. So some interesting stuff as to whether quantum clocks um, can, can firstly, can, don't re reduce their dependency on GPS and work indoors, maybe it would be cheaper and so on. So there's there's definitely some some interesting things there. Um, unfortunately, we we can't use quantum entanglement to break the uh, speed of light. Unfortunately, <laughs> well, people not say, yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> unfortunately, that that's uh, yeah. We're not going to have the instant teleportation. Unfortunately. Yeah. Um, so 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 there's a bunch of interesting stuff. Some of it is 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 a risk. Some of it is an opportunity. Um, I would say the other side to this was generative AI. Uh, well, I mean, there's obviously AI in, in various non-generative right, versions is right. certainly useful all over the the network and telecoms industry. You know, it can be anything from, I don't know, I've seen drones with machine vision to look at how much equipment is on a tower and work out whether there's enough space for another antenna or, or whether you whether there's a corrosion of the the metalwork or something like that. Right. So there's a, there's a bunch of things there which use, in that case, machine vision. But there's other stuff which is which is used inside the network to do optimizations for the radio channel selection. There's some some six uh, G coming back to that. Is like to have a lot of AI in the radio to optimize all sorts of sort of internal functions. Mm. And also you use it, you can use it to sort of predict customer satisfaction, dissatisfaction, try and use AI to forecast demand, um, you know, work out whether coverage can be improved. It, it sort of thing is like if you've got a, a pot of a billion dollars to upgrade the network, how do you optimize that? Where do you where do you place your money for for in terms of investment for, for optimal coverage, customer satisfaction, whatever. So there's a bunch of like non-generative AI stuff, which doesn't relate to the sort of large language models, all the stuff we've seen. And um, the, the the sort of intersection between all the new AI stuff uh, is is more difficult to tell. Um, there's clearly some stuff you can do, in, again, in customer service. If, if you check, train a large language model on all the chat logs, from your customer support, or you do all text to speech for all the uh, all the times you, you've called your um, uh, operator, and they said th this call may be used for train is recorded and may be used for training uh, purposes. What they didn't tell you is is you're training a robot, not not necessarily another human. Right. Um, and, and so there's obviously an awful lot of source material there. So so some of that makes sense to use for with with LLM type uh, artificial intelligence. Beyond that, um, I think, like everything else, this, this, some of it's going to be, can I do the marketing copy? Can I write, uh, can I use it to check code? You know, so there's a lot of people using large language models to either write code or to debug code, um, which obviously has much application in, in the telecom sector as anywhere else. Mm -hmm. So that's likely to help uh, developers. Uh, there's some cyber risks that come from this. Um, firstly, you know, if you're using um, these tools and you're saying, here's my you know, next year's business plan, can you rewrite it with better grammar? Um, then are you, you know, submitting your, your confidential business plan to the corpus of knowledge in right. one of these engines? So obviously you're seeing quite a lot of companies say- The answer is no, yes. You yeah, <laughs> you just yeah, did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you're not. Yeah. So, so in other words, yeah, you know, you've seen various companies say no use of um, ChatGPT or or something else or Bard inside our company until we've worked out what the threat surface is. Right. And it's sort of it's just mundane. I mean, so I I use uh, if I'm writing a blog post or something, I I, I generate interesting pictures with Mid Journey or Stable Diffusion right. just as, a, as an illustration. Um, yeah, but to be honest, that's, that's more just for sort of, you know, capturing eyeballs as much as anything. The other thing I find is is just 
I use, I use, I sort of use chat GPT. If I'm writing a report, there's always like an upfront paragraph of, you know, introduction, background, history, to be honest, is the tedious part of writing. I'd much rather get onto the, this is what's going to happen, what's not going to happen. But there's always like a mandatory page of blurb at the front, which everyone expects to be there. Right. And if, if frankly, I can reduce some of my time on that and spend more time on the, on the interesting stuff, then, then great. Yeah. Well, I've used ChatGPT a number of times and I love it if it's a subject that I know because I can tell when it gets it wrong. And it gets it wrong, not enough to not use it, but enough to proofread and pay attention to what I'm doing. I, I would plug my name into it. It says, what do you know about team? <laughs> and it basically told me I, I'd worked at IDC. And I'm like, no. <laughs> I did. Where's my back pay? Yeah, I was going to say I might, I might send that send that in and ask where our questions. But yeah, is it, yeah. Um, yeah, it, it, because obviously because I've been mentioned in articles which is quoted two or three analysts, it's probably associated with me with the name of three other analyst firms are on a, a conference roster where I'm on a panel and there's someone else from IDC. Right. Yeah, and it's probably well, Dean Bubbly often appears in the same sentence as IDC. Therefore, if you're standing around with a tasty drink in New Orleans, because if you don't, they're going to think you're suspect and you're having a conversation with people um you know maybe they're close to your industry maybe not exactly industry and you say mark my words in 10 years or 12 years this thing or these couple things um that we're not giving a lot of weight to now are for sure going to be a thing or they're going to be fully resolved or they're going to be discarded what would be that one or two thing without you know, I want people to have some mystery to go back to your list. But if there's one or two things that always like people react to you like, oh, really? Do you think that that's not going to be important or that's going to be important? What would that one or two thing be? Right. I think one thing that I think is going to change is what we think of as the telecoms industry itself. Um, and everyone always talks about whether it's 5G or anything else. Trans oh, it's going to be trans yeah, transforming other industries. Well, I think actually the first industry that gets transformed is the telecoms industry. Yeah, at the moment, if you look in, let's take mobile. Most countries have three or four major carriers, sure. um, mostly sure. national, sometimes regional, but you know, pretty much national. And there's maybe a couple of tower companies and a couple of virtual operators. And I think that that sort of identikit model is going to break down. And you're instead going to see a much more fragmented and heterogeneous array of service providers. So there's going to be traditional operators today, but there's going to be more wholesale players, there's going to be shared pro infrastructure providers, business only providers, services and networks run by governments, um, ones which are dedicated to utilities or rail networks, um, you might have municipal authorities or councils running their networks based on their um, physical assets and fibre in the ground with one of the you know, infracos, infrastructure companies backed by a yeah, private equity. Yeah, there's going to be indoor specialists. So there's going to be suddenly this whole zoo of new service provider types, um, which is going to make it much more difficult if you're a regulator or an investor. Instead of going from comparing three identical com companies, you've got this sudden 27. Are they companies? Are they public sector organizations? Are they all OPEX, CAPEX? What metrics and KPIs are we on? So I think that's one. Um, Another one which, and this is more of a hope, um, is that we will look at good statistics rather than easy statistics mm -hmm. to measure the industry. I get absolutely sick and tired of you know, things like ARPU, average rate of revenue per user. Yeah, you know, it, it, obviously because we've got lots of history using that, we stick with that number. Or if you're talking about fixed broadband, homes passed. How about homes connected or how about um you know revenue uplift for a given service or you know what's the relevant metric do we divide out and segment and double click on you know what is a user is it a, a smartphone user a car or something else uh, i think that um there's a lot of lazy use of aggregates of oh there's 47 petabytes a month of traffic well yeah, but you know, what part of that is indoors versus outdoors? Because that we've got different regulatory and policy levers and investment implications for that. Or is it fixed wireless access or mobile broad? So a uh, yeah, big wish of mine is for more intelligent KPIs rather okay. than the ones which are just easy to read out the back of the network. 
And why is that? What is it? What is it going to solve? What problem does that solve for you that that you think exists today? If we have that more accurate information, uh, I think better policy, um, oh. better investment decisions. Uh, so it's so a better policy by government, better investment decisions, uh, and frankly, more aligned incentives from for, for management. Because mm-hmm. at the moment, you, you know, I can't remember who's whose rule it was where people if you if you come up with a with a KPI people will manage manage the KPI rather than manage the business that yeah. generates the KPI um and so if you're going to do that at least make the KPIs good yeah for sure in in the data center industry um a few years ago we we're trying to figure out how to measure efficiency in particular as the hyperscales moved into multi-tenant colos um like we so we 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 do build a suit we do a wide variety of things but when you're in a multi-tenant environment they want they wanted the ability to affect their suite or data hall in terms of efficiency because they report their scope one two or three it's it's intrinsic to who they are they want us to report all these other things and so they in the early days, I think it was um, Chris Jeffrey, his last name out of Microsoft, but whoever coined it power utilization efficiency, PUE. And it was um, <clears throat> in the early days of that, as people embraced it, um, you know, we had, a, uh, we, we had a starting point of measurement. Now you move forward, people have figured out how to manipulate that. That's one of the biggest problems with that KPI. It's not just how do I manage my business to it, but operators can manipulate and create um, a, a a report that looks like something's being accomplished that's really not being accomplished because they've manipulated when and how and where. And I'm not criticizing the need for KPIs, in this case, this PUE in the data center industry, but sophistication has to come along in granularity to where we're saying this is what we're doing and how we're doing it and why it's relevant instead of just saying, oh, look, I checked the box. I'm I'm if I'm more efficient. No, we're not. Not necessarily. You're creating more carbon than you ever did before. What are you doing? Uh, I, absolutely. And I've, I've seen that in the mobile industry where um, a lot of service providers have done things like mm-hmm. um, spun out their tower businesses mm-hmm. or, outs- or sold off towers. And what that essentially does is it takes a bunch of scope two and puts it into scope three uh, because suddenly it's, it's, it's supply chain rather than internal. Right. And, that, and it may well be that they've got targets for reducing scope three, which are 10 years longer. Right. <laughs> and, and there was one in particular, which which made an announcement about um, spinning out their tower business or IPO, I can't remember what it was. Right. Um, and uh, and then a week later, put a press release, another press release out saying, we've hit our carbon targets five years early. And I'm like, hang on really? a second. <laughs> yeah, and it, it, I didn't drill into it. It just it jumped out at me as saying, yeah. "There's got to be some interesting accounting going on here." Yeah. So hopefully, hopefully, you know that that type of thing people will be a bit more aware of. But also, uh, one of the things I actually didn't talk about uh, on on six G, I quite like six G if it has some sort of energy estimation function mm-hmm. and actually design it to be not uh, everyone's this, everyone uses this metric of energy per bit. Mm-hmm. which is pretty meaningless because not all bits are created the same is how about just energy and, and actually number of bits is irrelevant because yeah, especially on fiber sending two gig versus one gig has got virtually zero incremental energy. Right. Um, and, and the other, the other thing is that, that often the, there's, there's this demand for um, data austerity of, Oh, we, yeah, maybe we should be compressing all the, the video. And I, well, all that's going to do, if you then watch compressed Netflix, is your energy per bit is going to go up? That's your KPI because right. yeah, you, you you might say one percent of energy, but fifty percent of bits. Yeah, and the, the maths don't work very well for you. Yeah. So I think I think all of that is 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 likely. Actually, one other other word we haven't we haven't discussed this at all, but I will throw in the word satellite oh. um, being more important than I would have said a year ago. Well, so the, I, I didn't talk about that because last time we did, so one of my first, and I know we, we, I've got plenty of time, but I'm trying to be real respectful of your time. But when we talk, I know you got to go, but I would just say that um, next time we talk, what is it that we're going to talk about satellites? Um, I think um, two things. One is uh, low Earth orbit satellites mm-hmm. partly for, for, for fixed wireless access broadband for you know, rural areas but also there's a big thing that's happened really only in the last six months which is it is called direct to device connectivity mm-hmm. which is 
you know, Apple did this thing with Global Star, where you, you've got the sort of, you're stuck on a mountain, you can send a message. But there's now a whole slew of developments around using an unmodified cell phone with satellites, either to send messages, someone did a trial showing they could use it for phone calls last week, maybe low speed data. That's, there's all sorts of, you know, interesting stuff and early stages of, of serious hype overhype on that i mean yeah there's, there's physical limits but it's 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 certainly interesting um and the question is sort of how far and fast it's going to go and, and where well that's a great place to end it uh how far how fast and where from uh, we didn't even talk about the metaverse other than our new guild um i'm going to be the night elf you can be an orc or you can be any of the other choices but i get the druid outfit but we're all going to wear the keychain with the dolphin hanging from it. Dean Bubbly, thanks for coming on. I really appreciate it. Hey, Thank everybody, you if you, you, my pleasure. If you enjoyed that conversation, like it. If you loved it, subscribe to it and uh, click on Dean's information down below. We'll talk to you next time, everybody. Take care. We'll see you.